morning, everybody. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. It's 
begun our Experiencing God Bible study, um, book study together as a church, the first week um, talked about what it, it means to kind of have the overview understanding of this relationship with our God. As I think about the song that we just sang, uh, this really is the centerpiece of what it means for us, that we have a God who has invited us into relationship to know him. Like, that's where it all starts. It's not it's not a to-do list. This is not a religion where we are binding ourselves back and working as hard as we can to accomplish that which we uh, expect of ourselves and we think that God expects of us. It is all born out of a relationship with him. And it is an incredible thought for us just to stop and remember that we have a very good father. Like We don't get to pick our God. We don't get to pick the God of the universe. We don't get to define him as we want to define him. He is who he is, and he does not change. He has existed forever and will continue to exist. Like, he is outside of time. He has created all of this that we see as a reflection of him and then put his imprint in us in a special way that we might relate to him. What an incredible thought that that God is a good God. A God that's not only pure and right, but one when wronged has chosen to send his son to bring back into relationship the ones he created. The whole picture to his glory and for your blessing. What he has done is so that we might relate to him in a way that everything we are is to the praise of his glory. He's a good, good father. And I hope you know him as that this morning. And if you do not, we invite you to consider that, that you would be in a relationship with him. If you are uh, a guest here, or if you came through a door and grabbed one of these, I want to direct your attention to just a couple announcements as we begin this morning. First, I want you to be praying for uh, Pastor Eric and his wife, Kelly. They are away. Um, they are celebrating 20 years of marriage uh, this weekend. And so just be praying for them as they have a chance to kind of disconnect and reconnect with themselves um, as they have some time together uh, in St. Lucia, wherever that is. But it sounds warm and beachy. Those are two really good things that help you to be able to unwind and reconnect. So uh, be praying for him as they are away. A couple of things that are coming up in your bulletin I want to direct you to. First, our lunch bunch um, is this week, it is uh, the 9th on Thursday. Opportunity for come uh, to come if you are 50 and older. Our new AMS, our um, whatever that stands for, Area Missionary Strategist or something like that, the, what we used to call the Director of Missions position from the Northern Kentucky Baptist Association, uh, we, we like to change acronyms just to mess each other up 
so that we can't get comfortable in them. But uh, he is going to be coming and sharing with us uh, during our lunch bunch time on Thursday for that. And so uh, we invite you to come and get to know him. He's only been here since October, and so it's a chance for you to meet him. Uh, he is the equivalent of who Jim Willems was for our association. If you remember who Jim was, uh, he was a member of our church for quite a while. Uh, yeah, I think he even served as an uh, uh, pastor, an interim pastor for us, even during a season of transition. And so uh, what Jim was doing for us is what uh, now uh, Charles Frazier is doing for us at our association level. The men's breakfast, however, normally would be this Saturday. It has been pushed back one week. Okay, so don't show up this Saturday unless you're here for the last weekend of Upward Basketball. And so you're welcome to come out and to, to meet people and to celebrate the season um, as we bring it to a close. I'm very grateful for um, the work that's been put in over this season, for the opportunities we've had to minister, to have our doors open, um, to have some good basketball, but also some good conversation. And so as we uh, are finishing up Upward Men, you're just pushing off one week, and that way you don't have to worry about uh, trying to be in two places at the same time. Um, you will also notice in here something that is exciting to me as a warm-bodied person. It says next week we're supposed to spring forward. That means it's coming. It's going to stay here, hopefully, soon, and not drop back down in the 30s and be nice and warm. But next week, um, we do, it is the losing hour time. It's not the fall where we gain the extra hour of sleep and you come in extra peppy. Uh, this is the one where you wake up and go, What happened? I don't feel the same. So make sure that you get to bed early, set the alarm clock so that you can, um, or change the clocks on Saturday, which is what I do. That way I look at, the, re at the, uh, the stove and I go, oh, it's bedtime. And we go to bed early so that we can wake up refreshed and ready for this coming week. I mentioned that many of the uh, studies have started up. If you are late to the game but want to be a part of an Experiencing God group, let me know. Um, we just met for the uh, first groups, met for the first week uh, this, uh, today, and so you're not that far behind if you would like to be a part of it. And then on the back, you're going to hear more about this, but as a follow-up to our sexual abuse training that we did for the church at large, um, there is a second tier of that that's about to roll out. You can read about that. If you're directly involved in children and in youth, you're going to be getting a, um, some information from Pastor Eric regarding those next steps. And so be looking for those in your email. If you don't get an email and you're connected to those things, make sure that we have the right email on file so that we can get you connected. If you're a guest, we're glad that you're here. There's a tear off in here. We'd love to get to know you. Hopefully you got a welcome bag. Um, you could fill out the information card in that and drop that in the offering plates um, as you're part of participating today and letting us minister to you. Um, we're here we have a, a church family that we have the opportunity to engage with, to sing songs with, to open up scripture with, and to hear from our good, good father with. And so that's what I invite you to do now. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that we do have this opportunity to come into this place. It is not something that we can do um, because of what we have accomplished, but because of what you have done, we come in response. And so may we respond today with open hearts, ready to worship, ready to meet with you, ready to hear from you, and ready to respond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There is a fountain. There is a fountain. And there may I 
wash all my sins away. You wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And then I go. Wash all my sins away, dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God. Ah. Uh-huh. 
the Lamb. You are worthy, Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are. You are holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, sing word. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Just the voices. Holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Sing it out. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Sing word. Worthy is the Lamb. You are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. As we reflect on the holiness of God, sometimes we, in our humanity and in our fallen humanity, aren't really interested in the holiness of our God and the holy calling that our God has upon us. I mean, if we're just really honest, sometimes we kind of prefer sometimes our own path and our own decisions, our own choices. We go by our affections, not by his word. We go by our culture, not by what he has given us as timeless truth. We're wrestling in that very thing even within our own church as we consider our lifestyles and how we have to call each other to live a holy manner. Across the street, today at 4 p.m., the United Methodist Church is being called to a moment. A holy God is up for debate. What he affirms in his word is a point of discussion. There are so many passages in scripture that talk about our fidelity to who God is, our sober-mindedness in what we understand, that we would be able to perceive the things that are going on in this world and recognize them. In Colossians 2, Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. At 4 p.m., Pastor Eric and that congregation will be asked to to vote. Every United Methodist Church in America must vote, I think it's by March 15th, whether they're going to stay in the United Methodist Church or whether they're going to ironically divide and separate from it. What is at stake is the position on homosexuality In this case, this church, if you've kept up with anything in the news, there is a global discussion that is happening in the United Methodist Church. The groups outside of America are more conservative in their understanding of Scripture and their desire to affirm the things that are here. The the church in America, um, the United Methodist Church, um, which does not have a majority, Um, has chosen to leave, to reject that teaching. 
And so the United Methodists are having a vote. And so here's how it shakes out for that church. It's a 51% simple majority, no, 66. I think it has a two-thirds vote of where they will go. Which means they will either stay in and affirm that they would receive, whether that's gay marriage, um, deacons, leaders, they would affirm that, or if they are to leave, that they would reject that as a non-biblical position and vote against it. For Pastor Eric, or for Pastor Andrew, it is a challenge in that he has made up his mind. He knows what scripture says and believes that it is not biblical. And so he will be resigning from the United Methodist Church regardless. It's just a question of whether his church will go or not. And in the midst of that, it's the question of how many of his church will stay after the vote and have to go find a different church that they will affiliate with. Andrew and his wife Arpita have a little girl, Eliana, born last fall. There's a lot of unknowns here. And so I want to invite us as brothers and sisters in Christ for that man and his congregation to pray. It is one thing to talk about these things. They're at a point where they have to vote on this. And it will affect the trajectory of their church and where they go. It is not a a theoretical thing anymore for them. It's at four o'clock today. A person authorized and sanctioned from the United Methodists will show up. They will take role and they will cast their votes. We preach and we teach truth as best we can. And we submit ourselves to this word because his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. It comes from the fact that we believe he's a good, good father and he's revealed himself. And we're trusting in him. There have been moments in this denomination's past where this book has been downgraded. We are in a season of life where God was gracious and allowed for a revival in the Southern Baptist Convention where this book was lifted back up to its place of prominence and inerrancy, the belief that this word is the truth, our sole authority for faith and practice as we describe it. The United Methodists have reached that moment that we reached about 50 years ago, 45 years ago. They're being asked the same question. And I want to invite you to pray on their behalf. And then I'm going to close this in a time of prayer for them. Brothers and sisters in Christ's lives will be changing today. May God have grace. May God have mercy. And even more so, may God move through this call to follow him. Will you take a moment and pray? Father, we do not grasp the weight of the events that are taking place across the street and across this nation in churches that are gathering to take a vote as to where they will stand. Father, I, th I think of them as they are meeting right now for Pastor Andrew as he is preparing to preach. What does he say? What are the thoughts and the hearts? Where are they right now in the room as they have met to come before you? Is it division? 
Or is it desperation? Is it an openness to you and your movement? Father, I pray for Andrew as he speaks, that you would give him words of great confidence that he is speaking your words to your people today. I pray for that congregation that they would see truth and value truth for what it is. Father, I ask as they gather that, they, that their hearts would be attuned to you so that when they go to vote, it is the mind of Christ at work. We are but the body. And Father, I can think of all the stories of the past all the failures of your people over and over again, whether it be stories in the Bible or maybe just history, whether that be a long time ago or even as recent as these moments now before us. Father, I'm grateful for the grace that you sustain your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm grateful that you're a sovereign God who is good. I'm grateful for the fact that you have sent your spirit and that you are accomplishing your will and that your will cannot be thwarted. I'm grateful that you have brought deliverance and that you have made promises that are unilateral for the future. That this does not depend upon us going out and working on your behalf or holding it together while we wait for Jesus. But instead, it is by your power and by your might that you continue to work in and through your people. To your good pleasure, as the book of Philippians says. Father, I know that your heart is broken over division. Your heart is broken over a people who are obstinate. Father, that's not just across the road. To some degree, we all can find ourselves in that. We may be settled on that issue. There may be another one that we hold too dear and do not submit or surrender to your word. God, would you give us eyes to see? So at the end of the day, we look to the God who has saved us and we proclaim our great thanks. That our joy is found in you, that our satisfaction is found in you, so that in our lives we are willing to lay them down for you. For you are worthy of our praise, you are worthy of our energies of our times of our thoughts of our obedience because you change people and you work and you are still at work and so we pray over these churches that meet today that you would work in a way that brings people to yourself that allows truth to triumph and the enemy to be rejected. And he would not have a foothold, whether across the street or in this very room. God, thank you. Thank you that you sustain, that you are at work, that you have saved that you continue to be at work and you will continue to save until that day when you bring us all home. God, give us the grace even now to be open to receive and to praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Typically, we move to a special at this time, but we decided that 
we would continue in worship. Uh, and we're going to sing a new song to the church. I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's called Gratitude. But I want to share with you When I hear this song, it reminds me of a story in the Bible, specifically in this bridge where it says, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, in this time, in, uh, this is in, in the Bible, it's about David, and uh, we're reading about David, and um, at this time in David's life, David was running from Saul, and at this point, he uh, was fighting with the Philistines, and they gave him the land of Ziklag to dwell in. And David and his men would go out, and they would fight, and they would come back. Well, at one point, David and his men, they, they went out, they were fighting, and they came back, and when they, when they came back to their town, Ziklag, they, the Amalekites had raided their camp and took all of their women and all of their children and all, that, and all of everything they had and all that was left was David and his men. Uh, and they were greatly distressed. They were weeping and they were, they were brokenhearted and even to the point where David's own men were gonna turn on him because they were so distressed and they were gonna stone him. And it says at this point, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. It's like that moment in, in this bridge. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy. Lift up your song because you've got a line inside of your lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. There's a psalm that goes with this. It's not a psalm of David. It's um, of the sons of Korah, but it's in um, Psalms 42. It's the same one that we get as the deer. But at the very last part, it says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted? disquieted within me. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. The verse before that, the enemies of this psalmist was saying, where is your God? It's so often, I feel like in our culture today, they, the, there is that like response to the Christians, where is your God? Well, our response is, don't be cast down. We, our hope is still in our God, and we will praise him. And just as David strengthened himself in the Lord, I encourage you, whatever you're going through in your life, strengthen yourself in the Lord. Hope in God. So let's sing this together, this song, Gratitude. If you would stand. I 
got one response I've got just one room With my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah Sing, come on. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. This is why we were made. So come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lungs, so get up and praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, my soul. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, come on. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. So get up and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again. All that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not mine, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah,
praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. That's all we have, Lord. We praise you. Lord, we Psalm 50, it says, uh, the Lord is saying, it's a, it's a prophecy for the people of Israel. And it says, the Lord didn't desire burnt offerings. If he desired it, he would go and he would go and I'm paraphrasing, but he would go and get his own goat. He's the, he's the one that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. But this is what the Lord wants, is an offering of praise. Psalm 50, that's what it says. He wants an offering of praise. This is what he wants us to give him. So we're going to go right back into that. And let's just sing to the Lord and just give him an offering of thanksgiving and praise. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord. hearts. Lord, we praise you. Now let's give them our love. Lord, we love. Lord, we have your Bibles, would you open them to Matthew 23, as my strong young man brings me the pulpit. He makes it look easier than me every time he does it. Matthew chapter 23, we continue in the final week of Jesus' ministry as we head towards the cross, the resurrection. A third of the Gospels focus on the last week of Jesus' life. A third of all that is written in the Gospels finds its content in that last week. You think about that and the impact that that has evidently on those disciples as they contemplated every word that he said during that final week. The value that those moments had and the impact that it would have on them. And so this morning we will continue to walk through it and we are going to look at the results of the conversation from last week. If you remember, if you look back, there was some questioning going on with this Jesus, getting his opinion on some different things in the law, getting his understanding of it, and then having him at the end challenge back those Pharisees. You will notice if you have a 
red letter Bible that the next three chapters are very full of his teachings. This is one of those final sermon piles of teachings that Matthew kind of puts together in this book. These are words that Jesus would speak. And so I ask you to stand in honor of God's word and we will read them. These are not easy words to read. But I want to read them. Not only for the historical perspective, but as God's word alive still today speaking to us. So then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. This is what he says. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and they do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries, they lengthen the tassels of their garments, they love the place of honor at banquets, and the chief seats in the synagogue. The respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders or teachers, for one is your leader or teacher, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whomever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses And for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Woe to you, blind guides. Who say, whoever swears by the temple, that's nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men. Which is more important? The gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he's obliged or obligated. You blind men, which is more important? The offering Or the altar that sanctifies the offering. Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. Whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, and ever neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these things, these are the things you should have done without neglecting the other. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, 
which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and are unclean, in all uncleanliness. So you, too, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. And you say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. So that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. So behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We pray. Father, I ask that you would speak to us today through your word. These words are very powerful. These words were very pointed. May they be just as sharp today for we who sit under your word to listen and obey. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the chapter is broken into three sections. There is a warning against imitating religious leaders in the way that these are behaving, a warning of their hypocrisy, and then a lament and judgment. It's interesting that after the conversations in chapter 22, Jesus turns to the crowds and to his disciples. I don't know if that's because he's ticked them off so much that these Pharisees have just decided to leave, Or that he's done with them and in light of their presence goes to speak to the masses now and talks about them openly in front of them. But we break this passage down and there are several things that we're going to take to heart. The first thing for all of us is our walk must match our talk. Jesus recognizes that these have chosen to sit in the seat of Moses. This would be the seat of the spiritual leadership. We could relate this to a pastor, potentially. We could relate this to uh, parents in a home. There's this position of leadership. And in this case, it is seen for the nation. And so we're talking to the Pharisees who have sat themselves in that position of authority, in that position of teaching and instruction that Moses occupied. But notice verse 3. He says, so because they sit in this place, do what they say but recognize that they do not do what they do. They do not practice what they preach. As a pastor, as one who preaches, let me tell you, this is always one of those passages that make me kind of go, hmm. Am I willing to think about the things that I am saying and the things that I am challenging the congregation to do? Am I first and foremost willing to do them? That is not an easy ask. One option is just to water it down so that we're all happy. 
but that's not faithful to the text. And yet, at the same time, I have to recognize that I'm not just to call you to religion, but to a relationship with this one. Because if all I do is call you to religion, I sound just like them. We all fail, we all do miserably, and we get nowhere. And so here is this indictment that is given of these leaders. We as Christians to an unprofessing world have to ask the same thing. Ask yourself right now, what are the incongruencies in your own life right now? Has God shown you things in his word which challenge your behaviors, your words, your actions? Are you consistent in the things that you say and know to be true and the way that you live those things out? Verse 4 calls these shepherds to their poor character. Because not only will they heap upon them great expectation, but they will do nothing to help. There was very much a divide for these religious leaders. They were the educated, wise, religious ones. Those people out there living their lives, poor, unfortunate souls. They were a mess. They rarely would engage them deeply, much less come alongside them. Often, the critique was that they were not worthy of the effort to help, for they were below the educated elite. Jesus goes right at it in all of the talk and all of the questions, just says, listen, you can get all your answers, but your walk doesn't match your talk anyway. Second thing I want you to see is this. We are to take no self-centered satisfaction in our position or influence. I, I was working on this point because there is There is certainly a joy and a delight and a satisfaction that we should have in that we are his and we should enjoy that relationship that we have been offered. But if that becomes misconstrued and self-centered, which it so often can become, then we are messing it up. Just as our walk is to match our talk so that Christ is exalted, so there is no room left for smug pride in our recognitions and titles. Look at verse 5. It says, they do all of these things to be noticed. The adornment of their clothes to match to the T the expectation of the Scriptures in the Old Testament. This idea that would date back even to the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where they were to bind the Scriptures on themselves. They made sure that they did that and that everybody could see it. They loved to be noticed, to be respected, to be revered. The words that he gives here for rabbi, teacher, leader, or tutor, or teacher. A rabbi is a teacher. It's also, um, the root word has this idea of, of a great one, a respected one. The word father that he's probably pointing to here is a reference to the patriarchs and to those other leaders of of the past, who have led the people well, maybe in Ezra. These church fathers, that we might even say. These leaders and teachers, these tutors, were pointing people to the Scriptures and trying to explain them to them. And he says, in so far as we ascribe to these things, it is so easy for us to enjoy the title and to be enamored by it and to give ourselves to it. You know, I grew up in a household where Mr. and Mrs. was expected. And yes, sir, no, sir, all of those kinds of things. There was a a deference that was taught, embedded. And in fact, every time it wasn't, there was a quarter taken. It was, yes, sir, no, ma'am. Usually, no, ma'am was only, did you clean your room? No, ma'am. It wasn't, please do this, no, ma'am. That's probably a dollar. But there was a level of deference that was taught and instilled. And as we go into a classroom, my kids don't don't call their teachers by their first name. 
right? There's a level of respect given. The challenge is when that goes to our heads and it becomes the expectation. We find our worth in it. We like it. Yeah, they call me that. And then become quickly upset when someone doesn't recognize it. People have asked me, what do you want to be called? You can call me BJ. You can call me Pastor BJ. I used to be Brother BJ. Maybe that's a better even term, brother. We joked when I got um, my ordination, the ladies in my office at uh, the other church, um, they said, well, now that you're ordained, You need a title. And so they called me the Holy High Right Reverend BJ. They put a little plaque outside my door. It was funny. We tore it down. But at some point, we have to be very careful that those things don't become not just a way of recognizing a position or authority, but it becomes what we feed off of. We can feed off of power and control and a place of authority very easily. Whether that's a boss, whether that's a teacher to their students, and what happens is the title creates a a dissonance between those that you're leading and those that are following. Those that lead start to separate themselves. And this is what has happened for these men. Jesus calls them out on this. He references at the end, verse 11 and verse 12 here, some lines that he's already said in chapter 20, but he repeats them now for a larger audience. And then he's going to turn to seven woes that are going to match Seven Beatitudes at the very beginning of his ministry. His very first sermon gives seven blesseds, and the last one gives seven woes. In this moment, Jesus goes straight towards these who are in leadership and exposes them. They are naturally paired, and so we will pair them two together, two together, two together, and then one on its own. The first one is 13 and 15. This is what I want you to see. Our impact has rippling effects. I'm trying to... I can put these in negatives, all of these points in negatives. Woe to you, right? I mean, we could certainly write each of these points from a negative perspective. But I'm trying to remind us today how that applies. And so the reality for them in the way that they have done it poorly is that their impact has had horrific rippling effects. And we have to recognize that each one of us has the same potential for rippling effects in our lives, whether for life or for death, whether for freedom or in slavery. Like, this is how we have the opportunity to share Christ and to live Christ. And so for us, the first one, our impact has rippling effects. The ironic state of affairs here is that the very people who are supposed to be opening wide the doors to the kingdom are the very ones who are shutting it closed. We have this rejection of Jesus as the Messiah and as of God's Son in Matthew 21 and 22. And so now you have Jesus calling out these Pharisees, that by their examples, they are prohibiting others from entering. And in fact, the flip side, the converse is actually true, that by their examples, they're not just leading them astray, but be more and more like them, more and more lost. By proselytizing, we gather others to our paths. And he says, you go to water, to land, to find a proselyte. But if we're the ones who are wrong, we only introduce others to failure as well. What a thought. If we go to convince people to join our side and our side is wrong, 
We not only don't open their eyes to understanding, but we harden and shut their hearts even further. That's a reality that every one of us faces. These Jews were creating passionate Gentile converts. They may have even embraced the ideals even more passionately than the teachers. They take it and they're zealous and they run with it. And so as far as the teachers miss the mark, their converts miss it even more. This is happening not just in Christianity, but this is happening in our world today. Do you not hear the voices of our culture calling for people to join their line of thinking, to embrace their ideology, their understanding of humanity, their worldview by which they assert certain things? Our culture spends its time mocking, rejecting Christianity, pushing its agenda upon us. They can gather many and loud adherents. But the problem is, even though twice as committed, they are twice as doomed, for they do not have Christ. The next coupling of woes starts in verse 16. I want you to see this. What we emphasize reveals the depth of our understanding. What we emphasize reveals the depth of our understanding. In misconstrued religion, we miss what matters most, and we try to convince other people of what is best. This is the reality that our natural implications, there are natural implications that flow out of our world views. The Jews did not believe that you could put a, um, an oath on the temple or on the altar. And so they believed that those things, any oath made in that way would be meaningless. And so they decided that the gold was what was important and the sacrifice on the altar was that which was important. In the second illustration, Jesus points out that sacrifice of stuff without sacrifice of self is a mistake. In both cases... The tangible is preferred over the intangible. It's so much easier, isn't it, for us to deal in concretes than abstracts. I, can, I know what the gold is worth. I don't, the, the spiritual being that it goes towards is a different nature. I, I know how much is meant in cumin and spices, and I can measure out a a tenth of each one of those, and I can do what I'm supposed to do, but to give a sacrifice of justice, of mercy, of righteousness. These Pharisees were putting all of the emphasis on the shadows more than the realities. They were valuing the horizontal more than they were seeing and understanding the vertical. They were majoring on minors and minoring on majors. In the last verse, in verse 24, he does a word play here. Nat and camel in the Hebrew are separated just by one letter transposed. So the the exact same letters, it's just the, the two middle letters are flipped. One, you end up with something you can hit with a fly swatter. The other, good luck. He says, you've missed it. You've got it backwards in your priorities. This is not a a tithing message. It's a reminder to major on the majors and to let those things fall into place. We can call it getting on our soapbox. Let me ask this question. What are the things that you've been advocating for lately? What are the battles that you've chosen to be a part of? What hills are you willing to die on? You will say that those things are probably major things. After all, you're willing to invest your time and your energy into them. My question would be, where do those things stand with the unity of Scripture, and even more so, where do they rank in relation to the vertical priorities of Scripture? Are they primary things? 
This is also the pick and choose model. It's an easier road. Tithing to the nth degree. He doesn't know I'm sharing this story. But I, I appreciate concrete. And so I have a, a child who tithes by moving the decimal place over on his uh, check. So that when I uh, see what comes out of his account, it's like whatever and 41 cents. Because he's like, it's 10%. I'm gonna, I want to give 10%. I want to give at least 10% of my gross. It's a great thought. He wants to make sure it's done. But there's an exactness to it. And I'm like, okay, that's the letter. Spirit, uh, you can round. It's okay. You know. But sometimes that's just the easy way of doing it. I don't know if it's a question of his heart or not. I'm just thinking that's an exact number there. I can check a box that way. But many of us do that on all kinds of things, don't we? We, we think this is what is necessary, and so we do what we think is necessary. And then we value ourselves and our worth and our significance and our relationship with God the exact same way. Oh, I've checked all my boxes today. I'm in good standing with God, and he's happy with me. More so, I'm happy with myself. Right? Because it's self-centered at the end of the day. And that's what Jesus just calls them out. And so be careful as we look at the scribes and Pharisees that we aren't too quick to defend ourselves and condemn them. One commentator wrote this. Christians in many ages have done a remarkable job in majoring on the minors and minoring on the majors. A scandal of the contemporary church is the unparalleled fragmentation into which hundreds of denominations of groupings have resulted. Many of these divisions have been over issues non-essential to salvation. True Christians must stand uncompromisingly against all professing believers who would teach if embraced, whose teachings, if embraced, would prevent people from being saved, but must also bend over backward to get along with and cooperate with those who differ on doctrines that do not affect a person's salvation. I think there's a lot to unpack in that statement. But I think the truth of it is we're watching it happen right across the street today. Is that we have to stand on truth. I get that. But that's a heartbreak to who God is and what God desires. And yet, so many other things, i.e. the color of the carpet, or other things that have split weaker churches, we let those things dominate instead of making room and grace to love one another. Jesus bookends these two woes with blindness, calling them blind. Those are hard words. Those who profess to see best are those who can't actually see it all is what Jesus says. So he challenges us on the path that we push, the things that we value, and now the congruency of what we are and what we project. 25 through 28, facades never truly hide decay. Man, this is a mess. They clean out the outside. They're like whitewashed tombs. How often have we presented ourselves in the same way? Everything is fine. Everything is good. The neighbor who says of the person who just shot their wife and child, well, I never would have thought he would have done anything like that. We are all good at making facades and having an outside that the world knows, but inwardly we hide. And Jesus calls them out to this and says, do you not understand that behind it is all kinds of filth? These things do not bring delight to the Lord that you have the outside looking all pristine if the inside is decaying. God does not look at the outward but looks at the inward of the heart. Facades never hide ultimately the decay inside. And if we never deal with it, 
This is where we end up, verse 29 through 36, an incredibly indicting statement upon the Pharisees and leaders. We can end up rejecting truth as we try to convince ourselves that we are right. How many of us have said, if I were there, I would never have? The reality is Jesus says, no. Pharisees, you would have killed the prophets then because you are about to kill me now. And I will send more to you, and you will do with them as you please as well. And ultimately, just like that picture where the Shekinah glory leaves the temple, so Jesus says, you have been now left desolate. And I am leaving this place for the last time as teacher. And the next time that I come into this place, it will be coming as the reigning God and Lord. At the second coming, Because you've missed the first one. This is not warm and fuzzy. This is such an affront to the leaders that it is after these things that it's done. All but the nails pierced through his hands and feet. He challenges their model, their message. A couple quick applications, bring it home. I want to challenge you to be careful what you look for. Wise man told me you always go, you will always find what you go looking for. If you want your view to be affirmed, There are people who are saying it. There's an internet site, I guarantee it. There's a podcast that will agree with you. Everything can be affirmed somehow. The question is, is it according to God and his character? Our phones have taught us how to wire our worlds around us. Everything in it is meant to affirm what we think, what we believe, and how we should live life. That's why we put them on our phone, because we like our apps. Second thing, what matters to us is too often backwards from what matters to God. I I think we, we read that statement And we don't realize the significance for ourselves. There are so many things that I'm blinded to in the way that I live out my life. And I think think those are right. And I've had my life rocked by the Lord at times where he's shown me, BJ, that's not the center. And I I pray that my eyes are open more often to be able to, to see from his perspective to value the things that he values. Because at the end of the day, all the messages in the world will not address the root problem of our lives. When we are left to look and think about all the discrepancies that we know about ourselves, there is only one thing, and that is God piercing into our lives with truth by his spirit. Our ignorance cannot hide that we have nothing with which to justify ourselves before God. And that's what these men constantly were doing. I'm convinced that too many people believe that if God does truly exist, he's going to be fine with what they've worked hard to become or with who they are. I'm convinced. And the reality is they're going to face a day when dealing with the Lord will become a very big Reality, not just vertically, but face to face. And they will have a Jesus who will have reached out to them. A God who has demonstrated himself to the world. Whom they've rejected. And that's a scary reality for all of us. But by the grace of God, we all go. And yet, the invitation is there that God has given us his son.
that if we put our trust in him and him alone, we do not perish, but we have life, abundant life given by him. Jesus is willing to call them out because it matters. Are you willing to let him search your heart? Because for you today, this week, your life, it still matters. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask as we come to this moment of invitation that you would allow these things that are spoken against these Pharisees in such dramatic fashion not to simply be things that were on a page spoken in the past, but things that should give us pause to come before our God with humility, to come be willing to open our eyes to what you value, to worship you and to see you as the one who is worthy of so much that we pull for ourselves and take delight in for ourselves. God, may we not be a people who have a hypocrisy that this world then ultimately looks at us for no hope because we look nothing like you. Instead, would you work? Would you call us into that relationship so that all of the other stuff flows out of our response? God, may we not just be working for you, working hard to verify or validate or to make sure that everybody understands or that we are, feel good about our positions but instead, may we love like you loved. May we give our lives away like you gave your life away. That others may know and receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask as we go out of this place that the love relationship that you have invited us into be the thing that motivates us so that our responses are in line with your nature, your will, your character, your ways. So that our worlds are not looking in to see a religion but to see vibrant life God I pray that you would continue to allow us to be transformed by the washing of your words so that those things that you value those things that you are doing those things that you have that you are and you've made us to be <coughs> would be the things that set our feet into action our hearts beating our minds to thought in Jesus' name we pray, amen.